on this single photograph. Um, Major Chatterton uh, was the commander of the uh, Glider Pilot Regiment Depot at Tilshead. That was his first appointment. Um, and it's just about that you will see the photograph, a group photograph um, at Tilshead. And number one is Chatterton. Um, and with the aid of um, two sergeant majors of the guards, Brody and Cowley, um, they, uh, the following simple principles were instilled in the regimental depot. Recognition of the high standard that will con constantly be required. The importance of bearing, saluting and drill. The highest standard of knowledge of infantry weapons. And on the next um, uh, slide, you can see the um, uh, different infantry weapons. The um, Lee Enfield rifle, the stand gun, Bren gun, but also the, uh, the the two and three inch mortars, jeep, the six pounder gun, all the weapons that were used by the airborne infantry. Um, full appreciation of the responsibility of his task, the vital importance of the ground subjects taught by the Royal Air Force, and um, that the regiment will only tolerate men of the highest principles and ideals. All volunteers received a medical examination and had to undergo a rigorous military training. If they passed that, they were um, allowed to proceed to the flying training course. More than half the volunteers failed at this point and were returned to the unit where they came from. The rest uh, were allowed to proceed to become total soldiers. And on, on this specific plate, you will see a glider pilot in his flying kit on the on the right hand side on the left hand side you can see one in his fighting kit with a big uh, bergen rucksack in which they had to carry all their equipment and all their stuff when they would go in operation um, and finally in the middle uh, the medical examination board and this man um, a, a sergeant or a later staff sergeant uh, griff griffiths uh, was fit to become a glider pilot um after having endured the Spartan intensity of the training at Salisbury Plain, life in the elementary flying training school was almost luxurious. The classroom syllabus included all of the staples required to form the foundation of flying training. Students were introduced to the theory of flight, meteorology, meteorology um, well, the weather in <laughs> plain normal words, map reading, Morse code, etc. And finally, the first flight in the Tiger Moth or the Miles Magister took place. And I think it's about to pop up the um, Tiger Moth as the first image. But uh, next to the Tiger Moth, also the Miles Magister was um, used. And I've got a little story of uh, one of the glider, trainee glider pilots, in this case, Trevor Francis. And it goes like the greatest psychological hurdle for most student pilots is successfully flying solo for the first time. For Trevor, this happened very suddenly as he accumulated the grand total of seven and a half hours of dual flying in the Magister. Having successfully flown solo, all appeared to be going well for him until the next day. While flying circuits and bumps around the Burniston circuit, he ran into problems. I suddenly found that I could not touch down without bouncing about 50 feet in the air. Finally, after trying for an hour, covered in sweat, my approach was far uh, up the field. I tried again, but with the flaps down and the full throttle, I skimmed the hedge, heading for the trees, which was by this time I could not fly over. So try banking between the two of them. The right wing hit the tree at about the height of 70 feet and snapped off whilst the plane spun around like a boomerang. I vaguely remembered spinning around the house, then seeing roof tiles and brick towers, one of which took off the left wing and the height uh, at the height of about 10 feet. 
Immediately, the fuselage spun in a circle, one of the towers taking off just behind me. What was left dived into the ground with the engine still at full throttle and being forced into the front pilot seat. A shaken but uninjured Trevor climbed out of the wreckage uh, to the sound of approaching ambulance sirens. Okay, if we look at the uh, training documents, um, then at the elementary flying and training school, you had some uh, different um, uh, exercises, about 28 of them. Uh, they were all um, set in, in a specific order. And at the end of the flying and training, the um, trainee pilot had about 109 hours um, uh, behind the steering wheel. Um, this is um, quite different from the second part of the training. By the end of 1943, um, the, 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 the regiment realized that they were not going to train enough glider pilots for future operations. And they decided to cut down on, on training hours. And uh, instead of training only first pilots, they designed a training schedule for second pilots. And instead of 109 hours total flying time, the second pilots were trained in just 15 hours and 25 minutes. So uh, a huge cut down in, in, in time and a huge cut down in the training. Next, off to the glider training school and uh, th where the would-be pilots were trained on airframes. And, and this is something that they could put into practice in Africa, which we will learn later. Uh, tactical landing flying the Hotspur training glider. And uh, uh, here you can see Cliff Wedgbury in the color photograph. And this uh, photograph was later also used to design a poster uh, on which Cliff uh, featured. And um, also I've got a very nice photograph of two of the Hotspurs in a training flight. Um, at the end um, of the glider pilot uh, training course, those that passed earned their coveted line with the blue wings. And again, if you look at the time of training, and if you look at the, um, uh, the number of exercises, the, the, the training hours, there is again a huge difference between uh, the training of the first pilots that were, would, would receive their, their line with the blue wings at the end of the glider training school and the second pilots that were trained at a later stage um, where they were trained to become second pilots and had to go to the heavy glider conversion unit to become first pilots. Okay, what would that mean in, in, into an aircraft? Well, the captain of, uh, of the aircraft um, is always a first pilot. And the co-pilot of the aircraft could be uh, a first or second pilot. And again, on, on, the, uh, on the plate, you can see the wings of the first and the second pilot. The second pilot wings were officially introduced in 1944, summer 1944. Um, on the heavy glider conversion unit, the newly trained glider pilots were converted to the Horsa glider. And um, from 1944 onwards, this was, as mentioned before, also the qualification to the first pilots. And on this photograph, again, we see Trevor Francis, um, third person from the, from the, right, uh, from the left. Um, and they were getting instructions by the um, RAF crew. This is the first cooperation between RAF crews and glider pilots. And you can see that's an early photograph with the round airborne strips still on their arm. In, in a later stage, they would get the glider pilot regimental strips. Um, on the next photograph, you can see a, a training glider, a horse a training glider with some uh, uh, stripes on, on, on the lower part of the wings so that the um, own anti-aircraft guns would not fire at the glider when they were on a training flight. Um, also interesting is to uh, see the helmets. Uh, the um, a number of the troops uh, already have the uh, helmet steel airborne troops um, and uh, quite a number also still wear the Brody helmets. 
This again indicates it's a very early photograph, probably 1942. Um, the next photograph will show you um, one of the horses being towed onto the tarmac, ready to uh, for a training flight, and um, the the next one after that is of um, one of the men hooking up uh, the tow cable, and this was uh, uh, this these were men from the naval staff that were specialized in rope tying. Then. The next one, we will see a tow master at work. And in this case, um, um, you can see he's towing off the glider um, at the runway. Um, for Arnhem, the tow master that was towing off the gliders that were going to Arnhem, um, at the last glider, asked one of his mates to do the, uh, the, the towing off, uh, the, 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 his work as a tow master. And he jumped into the uh, glider and hitched the ride to Arnhem. This was uh, Sergeant Mill, and we'll, we'll talk about him a little bit more next week when we um, discuss the Arnhem operation. Last but not least, um, some mass landings um, as a training for the future operations. Uh, again, if you look at the operations, and, and especially the Arnhem operations, but also the Normandy operations, um, talking to the glider pilots, they would tell you it looked like Travelga Square on a very busy day during rush hour. So that's roughly where they had to land their gliders. And, and this is a part of the training, which was quite important. So far the training. So we had the, the uh, elementary flying and training school. And we had the glider training school. And, and finally, of course, um, the heavy glider conversion unit. Um, if we look at the gliders, um, the first one we are going to talk uh, about is the Horsa glider. And uh, during a meeting in September 1940, the aircraft manufacturing company Airspeed was requested to design a glider. In December, the specifications of uh, this glider was provided, and it was to be of a wood construction and capable of transporting 24 to 36 fully armed troops. The company office in Portsmouth subsequently received orders to make production drawings based on the singularity important demand that all the components of the glider could be made on machines normally used for the production of furniture. The construction of the Horsa glider would ultimately involve no less than 28 main and subcomponent manufacturing firms spread across the, across the length and breadth of England. The main fu fuselage, for instance, was built in three main sections, the front, the middle and rear, by six different companies. The wings, airlines and massive landing flaps were constructed in a similar manner. And um, as were the tail section, the landing gear and the other main parts, Many women were involved in building the Horsa. All the parts were then brought together at the special assembly facility of the Royal Air Force. Here, all the separate components were assembled into the final product. And I think by now you will have the final product on, on the screen. Um, showing the uh, Horsa uh, glider and, and the different components ready to be put together to one aircraft. Um, on September the 12th, 1941, test pilot George Arrington made the first ever test flight with a Horsa. Um, Horsa with uh, registration number DG597. And if we look at the specifications of, uh, of the Horsa, it had a crew of two, the pilot and the co-pilot, a maximum of 29 troops to be carried and a payload of almost four tons. The length of the glider is over 20 meters and the wingspan almost 27 meters. The height finally is six, almost six meters. So the Horsa glider, the working horse of the British army Next to a troop carrying glider, they were, uh, they were also in need for a general purpose glider to transport the heavier arms required by the airborne forces. 
after pre preliminary uh, conferences and design studies, the general layout for the Hamilcar was finally agreed in 1941. It was considered advisable to design and construct a half-scale model. And this half-scale model, you can see um, in the um, left part of the photograph, and uh, in, in, in just a few seconds, a yellow arrow will uh, appear to mark the, the um, half-scale model. The crew, again, was two sitting in tandem, um, and the payload is seven tons. The length is almost 21 meters, and the wingspan 33.5 meters, and finally the height over six meters. So it was a huge glider, um, and it could carry um, a 17 pounder anti tank gun with its um, tractor, uh, a Morris Commercial C8. Um, the 17 pounder anti tank gun. And the, the crew of the, the 70 pounder anti tank gun all together in, in one aircraft. One of the other load configurations um, was the, that it could carry two Bren or universal carriers. And um, just about a few seconds, uh, 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 colorized uh, or original color photo will uh, appear with uh, a, a universal carrier driving out of the Hamilcar glider. And last but not least, it could carry the Locust and T-Truck tank of the Royal Armoured Corps. So you've got quite a number of different uh, configurations and different loads that could be carried by this, uh, by this Hamilcar glider. Um, the last glider I'm going to talk about, um, and, and we can be quite brief about it, um, is the Waco or Hadrian glider. Um, the Waco uh, uh, or Hadrian is um, uh, the glider that was used mainly in Sicily and in the Mediterranean area, and also used um, um, on a much uh, smaller scale by the British troops uh, ten were used during Operation Market Garden, um, but it was uh, the, the the most important glider for the American um, airborne uh, forces. So far, um, I think we have covered the uh, most important gliders um, of, of of the glider pilot regiment. Um, and the next thing I would like to take you on is um, a small talk on how, how they were loading the gliders. I think also very important um, uh, the way that uh, um, the, the different loads were put together into, into the gliders. And um, loading the gliders was the responsibility of the loading officer of the unit they were transporting. So um, each battalion, for instance, the, the, the uh, Kings on Scottish Borders, Border Regiment, South Staffords, Royal Ulster Rifles, um, the Devonshires, they all had um, their own um, uh, loading officers um, and, and they were responsible for, for loading the gliders. And they used, to, uh, they used a complicated computer to calculate the center of gravity and I can assure you, it, it, it gave them sleepless nights to, to get all the gliders loaded in the right way. And when finally loaded, the glider pilots would come, grab the tail, hang on to the tail, and when the nose wheel was just lifted off the ground, they would fly it. Um, for all the different transport functions, uh, extensive testing had been performed uh, for various types of loads by the Airborne Forces Experimental Establishment, a special research group. And one of the things they designed was um, loading schemes. And by June 1944, all of this uh, loading information was brought together in the so-called HORSA-1 loading diagram, of which you will see one now on the screen. And this shows you the configuration of an air landing platoon. A complete air landing battalion of 800 men, for instance, with all their gear, could be carried in exactly 60 horses using 19 different loading schemes. 
uh, th the diagram showed exactly who would sit where and how things should be attached and fastened down. Um, in this case, um, they had um, a table A, and the table A was a seat numbering plan. And this seat numbering plan was used to um, to make sure that every man knew where his place was in the glider. And um, also the seat numbering plan was used to fill in the form B glider. Form B glider is the loading manifest, which was the responsibility of the senior passenger. And in this case, Lieutenant Barnes of the 11 Platoon B Company, first border, um, signed the, 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 the form. And uh, Captain Hooper, the operations officer of the second wing glider pilot regiment, as being the captain of the aircraft, signed uh, the document as well. Um, if you look at the dots, um, they, they show you which seats were taken. And if you compare the seats with um, the official uh, loading diagram, you will see that there is a slight difference uh, because someone is sitting in seat number five, which is uh, at the door, and a set of 25, in this case, 26 men were carried in, in, in the glider. And when all was uh, worked out as planned, um, all these men together in the glider would look like the next photograph, which will come in a few moments, uh, which is a glider infantry platoon in a Horsa glider. And you can see how tight and how, how close together they, they would be sitting during the flight with all their gear and all their equipment. Um, and uh, for, for the arm operation, it meant that they had to sit together like this for almost three hours. Um, next up is loading transport into the Horsa gliders. And loading transport is quite a different uh, story. Um, first of all, um, in the Mark 1, the Horsa Mark 1, um, you had to load all the jeeps and guns and all the other equipment through the side door. And to make it possible, they had a special loading trestle. And this loading trestle would uh, be attached with two studs to the door. door. And this way, it was possible to dri drive jeeps and, and guns into, into, the, into the glider. So the Horsa became the workhorse of the British Airborne Forces. In addition to troops, it was used to carry everything from supplies, jeeps, trailers, bicycles, motorbikes, to heavy weapons, including artillery, into the battle. For the airborne divisions, this also included their divisional staffs, the transport provided by the Royal Army Service Corps, workshops of the Royal Engineers and RIMI, and the supplies of uh, three complete field hospitals being transported in those horses including doctors, surgeons, dentists, and orderlies. Um, Lieutenant Colonel Peyton Reed of the 7th Battalion Kings on Scottish Borders wrote um, a, a nice few words about his loading officer. Um, the appointment of the battalion loading officer was at once important, difficult, and thankless. Since on his knowledge and attention to detail, the safety of the gliders depended Though others did not always appreciate the mathematical precision he found uh, it necessary to apply. In consequence, he had to be ever on the alert to prevent officers, sometimes the most senior ones, slipping in an extra bicycle. A few extra pounds won't matter. Our own loading officer, Lieutenant Finlay Wilson, uh, having with true Scottish thoroughness made a more than usual detailed study of the logistics involved, proved more than a match for the most skillful smuggler and was quite unrelenting whenever any form of overloading was mooted. In consequence, all members of the battalion flew with confidence, born to the knowledge that their horsa, in which they had to had um, initial fate was probably loaded and perfect balanced. And you can see the two gentlemen on the photograph, Peyton Reed on top and then uh, the loading officer, Lieutenant Finlay Wilson. And of course, you can see the um, uh, loading trestle being used to drive in the Jeep into the Horsa. Um, 
this is for, uh, getting into the Horsa, which was quite a spectacle on its own. And then when you're in the Horsa, there is another um, uh, challenge you have to take. Um, when loading the glider, uh, the center of gravity, as mentioned before, is very important. When not correct, the glider is nose or tail heavy and puts extra strain on the tow rope. Um, here you can see uh, the, the Horsa. Uh, this is uh, the, the uh, side view showing the loading stations. Uh, each number is, is one of the loading stations and you can see the main spar of the glider. Um, and the, ma the main spar is, is the part uh, which is used for the center of gravity. So both, um, both sides of the main spar should have the same weight. And a Jeep um, would just pass under the main spar um, when the steering wheel would be taken off. So that's that's how um, low the main spar was into the body of the glider, into the fuselage. Each vehicle had a center of gravity calculated and marked with a marker on the side, indicating its position to its load station. And on the drawing, you can see at the number um, 10, the uh, position of the six pounder gun and at 25, uh, which is the load station of the Jeep and on the side of the Jeep. And if you go to the uh, commemoration services and you see the Jeep drive around, you will see there is a yellow stripe on the airborne Jeeps indicating uh, the load station. Um, each drawing is um, uh, showing the exact location, the, the, elect, uh, the exact load station. Um, and um, in this case, we will see photographs of uh, a six pounder gun and a Jeep in the uh, Horsa glider. Um, once seated in, in the glider, you could not go from front to back uh, or the other way around because uh, there is no way you can get past the gun and or the Jeep. So when you would be sitting on the tail end of the glider, the whole right, uh, the whole operational flight, you will be sitting on the tail end. Each drawing is, is showing the exact load lo location um, also, for instance, for motorcycles um, and, and the other pieces of transport uh, that will be taken into the air. Um, and also there is um, a lashing scheme showing how to lash the load. Each spar in the fuselage is a numbered load station. And the load is uh, again connected to its load station with stainers, chains, slings and quick release hooks. And again, uh, you will see the uh, scheme, the motorcycles, um, and you can see the different um, uh, strainers, uh, the, the, the different uh, chain slings and the quick release bolt. The Airborne Forces Experimental Establishment experimented with all kinds of different types of loadings and the way how to fasten the different uh, um, pieces of equipment into the glider to prevent that the, the load would move, for instance, during landing or during takeoff or even during the flight when it was very bumpy. And you can imagine that it's not very healthy if you would be sitting uh, in a glider with a shifting load. Next up is uh, the way um, how the um, equipment is taken off the glider. We now know how to get it into the glider. We now know how to secure it in the glider. And the next thing is um, the, the, the unloading of the glider. And unloading the Jeep and the six pounder gun uh, required the uh, removal of the tail of the glider. That is for the Mark I. The Mark II had a nose that could open and close, but in this case, it's the tail that had to be taken off. And here you can see a nice drawing of the fuselage and the tail of the glider. And uh, the whole thing was connected with uh, um, some nuts and bolts. Um, I have a little story um, uh, of Louis Hagen or Louis Haig, uh, a glider pilot that was flying to Arnhem. And it's, it's quite a stressful job to get the tail off, um, which required both pilots working together for at least 15 to 20 minutes. Um, Louis Hagen describes his um, landing at Arnhem and, and, and the subsequent taking of the tail as follows. 
Mac and I start on the heavy bolts inside the tail, eight of them, and they have to be synchronized. Meanwhile, two of the passengers lose the shackles on the Jeep and the trailer, and the third one begins to cut the control wires. Mac and I are sweating like pigs. We have to work together and reach the same stage of the operation at the same time. We have to be quick. Safety wire cut. Backwards and forward with the release lever. One by one the bolts come out. Not so hard really. Pretty much like the drill on the station. I'm struck now. The bastards are getting more and more difficult. I sent one of the passengers to stick the trestle under the body. We get down to the last two bolts. Must be completely together now. Mine is quite loose. Ready, Mac? Right, go. With a terrific crash, the whole tail fuselage falls off. So, in my story, under a minute, but in reality, this is 15 to 20 minutes work to get the tail off and to get it out uh, aside. And then um, when finished, Jeep and trailer or six pounder gun or the 75 millimeter howitzers or whatever uh, um, transport they had in, 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 in their glider was able to drive out. And you can see the Jeep getting out of the glider and of course um, it's six pounder gun. Um, you have been listening to me for uh, Zit je erin? Hello everybody, <laughs> we have a, a connection and a technical problem, so uh, my colleague is uh, trying to keep, uh, trying to get Luke back for the second part of uh, the presentation. So he's, he's back now, so um, we're going to start the presentation again and then hopefully we will stay with us uh, to see the, the second part of, uh, of his presentation. Okay, I'm... Um... Joel? Yep. Hello? Yep, ik ben er, uh, Luc. Oké. Okay. Um, zitten we online? Ja. I am sharing the screen, um, I think. Sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll stop it and share it again. One moment. Um... Still uh, uh, busy with the technique, uh, guys, but uh, we'll be there in uh, a couple of minutes. So Luke is uh, sharing his PowerPoint again, and we will be all back in uh, Take a Beer. I'm also uh, taking a beer, <laughs> and then we'll be back in a couple of minutes with the presentation. This should be it. Yes, we have the, um, I see a, a movie, uh, Luke. I'll No way. Did I? Yeah. One moment. Okay, we zijn uh, hebben even one moment nog. Yeah.
British Army's airborne divisions, proved by recent events to be equal to any in the world, are a new fighting arm of which the nation has every cause to be proud. Assembled here prior to a big scale manoeuvre, airborne troops were inspected by their GOC. Long months of arduous training, plus the best quality and most suitable equipment the war factories can manufacture and experts devise, plus a tactical and strategic technique based on up to the minute present war experience, have all gone to the making of a spearhead force fully worthy of the fine army behind it. The variety of equipment here inspected by General Gale, its weight, firepower and novelty are a revelation to the layman. Yet it can all be carried by air. There's not an ounce too much, not an ounce too little. The portable radio is probably the best in the world for its weight. Once on the scene of battle operations, the troops are radio directed and one of the objects of the present exercise, on which was used the new Piat mortar, was to make a thorough test of all kinds of equipment. This is a mortar bomb container for the three-inch mortar. This is a sniper's rifle. Even the jeep car, familiar object on every front where the United Nations fight, can be transported in the huge gliders we shall see later on. Indeed, airborne technique has greatly progressed since that day some years before the war when the Red Army dropped parachutists in view of a critical audience of foreign military attaches. This is the six-pounder anti-tank gun. The immense carrying capacity of these craft makes it a simple matter to take jeep-toed six-pounders to deal with any tanks the enemy may bring to bear on the attackers. In any case, the six-pounder is a formidable piece of artillery in operations of this kind. It's easy to understand that all the concrete emplacements and split trenches in the world are of no more use than bows and arrows against invaders who can fly over them. Your modern British Army fights in three dimensions. And as the air flank is the hardest to defend, as, for all practical purposes, it embraces the whole sky, it's easy to understand that the airborne spearhead of the army is a battle-winning asset. Now for the men. Embarking drill ensures that they get aboard quickly. It has taken time for the British Army to get ahead with airborne divisions, but now they have adopted this arm, it's pretty safe to say that no army, whether friend or foe, has a better one. We are built that way. Each giant glider is piloted by an army man, trained for that highly responsible job by the RAF. The twin-engine towing planes are standing by, and with the expertness born of long practice, the motorless craft hook up to the planes and are quickly hauled up into the air.
travel is no pleasure trip. Lacking the steadying influence of an engine, the light craft may but be going. Often, experienced RAF men are airsick on their first flight in a glider. But to your trained airborne man, the ordeal is nothing. He's got over it, found his air stomach, and is fit to fight the moment he touches ground. They sometimes blacken their faces, especially if landings are timed for dusk or dawn, when the less conspicuous they are, the better. One of the good points about gliders is that they can land in much less space than an airplane requires, nor does the surface, within reason, matter very much. If necessary, they can be crash-landed almost anywhere. Nevertheless, accidents can happen at this stage. If a glider crashes badly, it may mean the loss, at least for the time being, of men who can ill be spared. Nothing, however, went wrong with any of the landings during the present operation. Each craft was put down skillfully, disembarkation rapidly proceeded. The first men out made for the little cops, the objective assigned to them in the general plan. It was to be the place from which they would take the radio location center from the rear. Other sections, with objectives more open to enemy observation, began by camouflaging themselves. Note that the camouflage had to be obtained on the spot, or it would not have been of the right kind and color. As much as possible of surprise must be preserved in this, as in all military operations. If the enemy has already discovered that he is being attacked, he can still be kept unaware of the strength of the invading force and of the quarters from which the assaults are developing. Right, I hope uh, everyone can hear me now. Um, we are um, we have been talking about the um, different units. We've been talking about the training. You've just seen a film about the training, which I think is very, very spectacular. Um, and the next thing I would like to talk about is how was the uh, regiment organized? And we have the uh, headquarters of the Glide Pilot Regiment. Two battalions, um, the uh, first battalion and the second battalion, the uh, and each battalion had um, uh, the, the battalion had four companies, each 100 pilots. Um, each company had five platoons of 20 pilots, and each platoon had two sections of 10 pilots. That was the organization that was used in 1942 and 1943. The next up is the operational bit. Um, before Arnhem, the, the glider pilot regiment did quite a number of uh, operations. And the first ever glider operation in, in, in the Second World War from the Allied side was um, an operation in Norway uh, called Operation Freshman. Um, quite early in the war, it was known that the Germans were experimenting, uh, experimenting in the production of an atomic bomb, of which a compound described as heavy water was an essential part. And it was believed that they had made considerable progress. It was most important that these experiments should be dislocated and uh, the production of the bomb delayed as long as possible. Operation Freshman was executed on November the 19th, 1942. And uh, in the early evening, uh, roughly around six o'clock, two Horsa um, Halifax combinations took off from RAF Skitten, a satellite of RAF WIC in Scotland. One of the gliders piloted by Staff Sergeant Strady and Sergeant Doig of the Glider Pilot Regiment, and the other flown by Pilot Officer Davies and Sergeant Fraser of the Royal Australian Air Force. And on the photograph, you can see um, both uh, Doig and Strati. Their load was two duplicate teams under the Lieutenants Allen and Mapfen, uh, with men of the 9 Field Company, Royal Engineers, and 261 Field Park Detachment of the Royal Engineers. The first glider crashed at Filesdalen on top of the snow-covered mountain overlooking the Lyles Fjord. Both pilots, Trudy and Doig, and Lieutenant Matfen, were killed immediately. 
Four men were severely injured and five were uninjured. The latter were later killed by the Gestapo. The second aircraft and glider crashed immediately after crossing the Norwegian coast. The glider crash landed in the mountains northeast of Halleland and the Tuck near the farm of Hallevan. In the glider, three men were killed immediately and the remainder were captured and shot within a few hours. The crew of the Tuck were killed during the crash landing. So the first ever glider operation on the Allied side was not a great success. On the photograph also, of course, the heavy water plant in, in Norway. Um, the next uh, operation was more or less an operation that would start from Africa, to be uh, more specific, Tunisia, uh, in the direction of Sicily. And the first airborne division was in the Mediterranean from April to December 1943. As regards to the glider pilots, the training situation was really desperate. The very limited resources of 38 Group RAF could produce a, min a maximum of 50 trained army glider pilots, uh, glider pilot crews with concentrated training resources in the UK. The only solution was to send as many glider pilots as possible to North Africa to complete their training there using such resources as the US Troop Carrier Command could provide. None of the glider pilots had been trained on flying the Hadrian gliders and a few had been trained on the Horsa. None of the crews were trained in night landings. And when they reached North Africa, due to be trained, uh, due to be trained there, they found that the Hadrians were still en route in their crates from America. However, sufficient number arrived to enable training and started three weeks, weeks later, most of them being assembled and erected from the crates by the glider pilots themselves. Um, you have seen the logbook of um, Mike Hall, one of the glider pilots that was flying the Jeep and six pounder gun, uh, sorry, the, the, the Horsa glider um, on Turkey Buzzard. And these Horsas were flying from RAF Portreet in Cornwall to Froha, south of Mascara in Morocco, some 1400 miles, mainly over sea. Then some 600 miles over high mountains and desert to the operational base near Susan, Tunisia. Um, out of the um, 29 Horsas that left um, these Horsas, they were flown in because uh, they could carry a Jeep, six pounder gun and crew in one glider. Uh, this is, and I'm getting a message again that my internet connection is a little bit unstable. Um, so if um, we get disconnected, yeah, we are disconnected, I think. And I think we are back online. Um, yes. Um, the, the first operation, Sicily, was Operation Turkey Buzzard. Um, uh, that was the, the carrying of the Horsa gliders. Then we had Operation Ledbrook, and uh, Ledbrook was the... Um, target Ponte Grande Bridge at Syracuse, um, for which they used 144 Varco gliders, Hadrian gliders, and six Horsa gliders, and they were transporting the first air landing brigade. And this was a big disaster. 65 gliders were force landed in the Mediterranean, uh, 252 men drowned, um, and I can tell you one thing, the Sicily operation is a lecture on its own. Next operation um, is um, Operation Fustian. Um, and Operation Fustian, and I've got a few photographs which will pass showing um, a Hadrian in the sea and a Hadrian force landed, crash landed uh, uh, on uh, the soil uh, on the grounds of Sicily. Next operation uh, is Operation Fustian. And uh, this is the first parachute brigade landing in the area of the Primsol Bridge as their primary target. And um, again, uh, 18 jeeps and 10 six pounder anti tank guns uh, were flown in in eight Waco gliders and 11 Horsa gliders. And in a minute, uh, the photograph will show up. 
After Sicily, the 1st Battalion moved to Italy, and by the end of 1943, it moved back to the UK. Um, the 1st Independent Squadron was formed and remained in the operational area in the, of the Mediterranean, and it was involved in operations in so southern France and Greece, and it also was um, supporting Tito's partisans in Yugoslavia. Um, so you can see that the Glider Park Regiment, the first big operations were not really a great success. Again, uh, in the Sicily operation, they lost quite a number of men, um, force landing in, in the Mediterranean, uh, quite a number of people drowned. So again, not a great success. Um, with uh, Christmas uh, arriving, um, the um, second battalion had a, a special Christmas card made with um, uh, the um, capturing of the canal bridges at Syracuse um, uh, in the in, inside of a very nice drawing. Um, and uh, by this time, they also had a very nice sweetheart brooch that was presented to the girlfriends uh, on, on, on arrival back in the UK. So you can see um, on the next photograph, the Christmas card, uh, the sweetheart brooch and two of the Christmas uh, menus that was at the uh, RAF Terrence Rushton and uh, Holmesley South. Next up, uh, again a reorganization uh, and in this case um, one of the first things that Air Vice Marshal Hollinghurst uh, observed on taking over 38 Group RAF was that the air crews had insufficient sympathy with the tribulations of the glider pilots. This was mainly because the glider pilots, except when they were doing their attachments, were not uh, then accommodated on the RAF stations, not even near it. So uh, there was no opportunity for the personnel to knob hop, uh, of, uh, hop knob of duty, which is so important. Thanks to the cooperation of Colonel Chetton, this was quickly, uh, quickly um, remed remedied. The Glider Pilot Regiment was reorganized in the headquarters of the Commander Glider Pilots and two separate wings, which took the place of the old battalions. The wing headquarters was so designed that uh, it could be completely independent, so that if necessary, it could work on its own overseas. The squadron and flight headquarters were also independent, the squadron commander being at the disposal of the RAF station commander. The ideal aimed, um, aimed at was for a, a flight to consist of 20 glider crews, each of two pilots, where a RAF squadron consisted of 16 plus four aircraft. So one glider crew for each aircraft. If you make a quick calculation, uh, 26 flights at, at least five, uh, could uh, at least have 520 gliders uh, uh, flown in for the next operation. Next operation being D-Day, uh, the D-Day operations. Again, uh, uh, a separate lecture could be held or even more than one uh, separate lecture could be held, uh, held. So I will be as brief as possible on this operation. Um, the commander, 6th uh, Airborne Division was giving the following tasks. Um, the primary task is Operation uh, Dead Stick. And Operation Dead Stick was the capturing of the bridges at Benoville and Ranville and establishment of a bridgehead sufficient deep uh, to enable them to hold uh, the, 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 their positions. And this task was given to D Company, uh, 2nd uh, Battalion, the Ox and Bucks Light Infantry, part of the 6th Air Landing Brigade, 6th Airborne Division. Um, you can see on uh, the screen a small map. Um, showing the area of operations of the um, airborne forces, the British airborne forces, and um, uh, their target was flank protection for the Swart Beach landings, and they used uh, 318 horses and 34 Hamilcar gliders. Next photo up will show you the Pegasus Bridge and the three gliders uh, that were in, on Operation Dead Stick absolutely fantastic flying, uh, great respect for the pilots and, and uh, this, this, this was done at night 
um, with a lot of flying involved, um, well, it's it, it's a very good thing for for a next lecture, I think. Uh, then we have Operation Tonga, uh, the destruction and the neutralization of the coastal battery at Franceville Plage or um, Merville Battery by dawn minus 30 minutes before the seaborne assault craft engines uh, crafts came in uh, within range. Also, the destruction of the bridges over the river Deves in order to impose the maximum delay and any enemy movements from the east. Finally, and last but not least, Operation Mallard. Uh, Mallard. Um, the mission objective was uh, to airlift the glider infantry of the 6th Air Landing Brigade and the divisional troops to reinforce the British 6th Airborne Division on the left flank of the, flank of the British invasion beaches. They were using two landing zones, one to the west of Khan Canal and the other to the east of the River Orne. Mallard was the third airborne operation involving units of the division on D-Day. And again, a total of 318 horses and 34 Hamel cars were used to fly in the operation. Um, the glider pilots, they were used for next operations. And because they, they were quite expensive troops, because they were trained as soldiers, they were trained as pilots, they wanted them off the operational area as soon as possible. And uh, each individual glider pilot had in his AB64, his, his uh, uh, pocketbook, he, he had a special note from uh, Brigadier Chatterton or Colonel Chatterton at the time, the command the glider pilots, that they had to be evacuated off the um, operational area uh, at first priority. Uh, so the majority of glider pilots were back in England within days, some returning home so quickly that they were barracked by the civilians for being on the wrong side of the channel. Next part, after Normandy, and, 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 and Normandy involved the 6th Airborne Division, so at the Normandy, uh, as the Normandy campaign developed, a series of reinforcements or, or blocking operations were planned. The 1st Airborne uh, Division and the 1st Polish Independent Parachute Brigade Group were held in reserve, in reserve uh, uh, in the UK and went through a repeated cycle of planning, preparation and rehearsal for no less than 15 operations. The frustration and stress of being out of the battle and then pitched into the frenzy of nego uh, neg negatory planning against a deadline soon began to affect morale. The majority of these operations, oops, I'm going a bit too fast. The majority of these operations included the use of gliders and the small staff at the glider pilot wing and squadron headquarters were fully engaged in the planning. And even before the long awaited Normandy breakout was achieved, there was a continual cycle of planning, cancellation, planning, and again, cancellation. The volume of staff work and um, the logistical effort was immense. And each time the respective operations were about to be mounted, um, participating troops would be placed in isolation. This isolation and preparation for battle imposed its own unique pressure on glider pilots and infantrymen alike. And then, um, by the end of August, um, there was a breakout um, and, and two um, uh, armored divisions, the 11th Armored Division and the Guards Armored Division were racing through France and Belgium uh, at a speed that, that they couldn't really imagine themselves. Um, from 28th of August to the 4th of September, um, in, in just five days time, well, a bit more than five days, um, they, they, they covered 275 miles. Um, they, they were advancing faster than the Germans could withdraw. And, and, and this, this whole thing of, of this quick advance inspired um, uh, the staff to um, organize the next operation, Operation 15, or um, as it was called later, um, Operation um, Comet. Um, Operation Comet, General Urquhart gave uh, a detailed briefing 
and issued uh, his operation orders for uh, Operation 15 to his commanders at RAF Cottesmore on the 6th of September. And, and mind you, we, all, we are now already in September. Um, and, and the orders were as follows. Uh, the 1st Airborne Division, with under command the Polish Parachute Brigade, is to secure the bridges over the Rhine at Arnhem, over the Waal at Nijmegen, over the Maas at Grave. Uh, the objective, uh, the, uh, sorry, the object of the task is to hold the route into Germany for the Second Army. And for, for quite a number of you, this will sound familiar. The bridges are to be secured against demolition in the first place by coup de main parties of the 1st Air Landing Brigade landing at 4.30 on the 8th of September. At Arnhem Bridge, the second, uh, a, a company of the 2nd Battalion South Staffords, at the Nijmegen Bridge, a company of the 2nd Battalion Kings on Scottish Borders, and at Grave Bridge, a company of the 1st Battalion, the Border Regiment. The first lift of the main body is to land at about uh, 9 o'clock on the 8th, and take the bridges as follows, Arnhem Bridge by the 1st Parachute Brigade, Nijmegen Bridge by the 1st Air Landing Brigade, and Grave Bridge by the 4th Parachute Brigade, later to be relieved by the Polish Parachute Brigade. And then the coup de main parties were to rejoin the units um, uh, on their relief. Staff Sergeant uh, Jimmy Woolwork, uh, pictured on the, uh, uh, on the plate uh, right now, um, who flew the lead glider of the mission to seize Pegasus Bridge, recounted his feelings when selected at short notice for what was now a dawn coup de main operation on Nijmegen Bridge. And mind you, um, they were training for a long time for D-Day, and uh, in, in this case, Urquhart gave the orders for the operation on, on the 6th of September, and it was to be executed in the early morning of the 8th of September. And, and uh, Jimmy Woolworth's remarks were, you say it is strange that expertise generated during the dead stick training was not used in the next operation, but it almost was. About two weeks before the actual operation market, I, with Staff Sergeant Stan Pearson as my co-pilot, were scheduled to land six gliders at night beside the bridge at Nijmegen. The other five crews had no training, but were to follow us and land on the mud flats against the bridge. Our load was KOSB, commanded by Major Buchanan of the Whiskey family, whose main interest was that several bottles of his brew were secured in the glider and were not damaged on arrival. Pearson and I knew from the start that we would arrive alone and decided to surrender as soon as possible and call it a day. I didn't tell anyone, of course, which was well, since it was cancelled. We all returned to our squadrons. On uh, the 8th of September, in the evening at 9 o'clock, the operation was postponed for 24 hours. And again on the 9th of September, a quarter past nine in the evening, the operation was postponed again for this time 48 hours for tactical reasons. And then finally, on the 10th of September, at a quarter past four, Operation can uh, Comet was cancelled and Operation 16 was brewing up. Um, the last map I am showing you is the front line as known on, on, on September the 9th at um, uh, half past six in the evening. Um, and you can see that the Germans uh, had quite some, some units already in position. The 15th Army withdrawing across the Westerskeld, uh, the 7th Army and the 5th Panzer Army uh, in position, and um, the, the, the Allied troops had 30 corps in Brussels, um, the, the guards armored position uh, division in the forward position, but they didn't um, yet cross the Dutch border at this stage. And for Operation Comet, it was vital that the Allied troops had already uh, captured the town of Eindhoven. So um, this is roughly where we stop uh, today. Um, I've got uh, another two slides to come, um, but, but mainly this is um, uh, Operation Comet ending 
and, and taking over in uh, Operation 16. And uh, you all probably wonder what the Operation 16 will be. Well, uh, I, I will tell you, we were going to talk about that next week, next week uh, on uh, the uh, Thursday evening again, roughly at eight. Um, some recommended reading on the next page. Um, uh, of course, uh, the history of the glider pilot regiment by Claude Smith. Um, uh, this is a book covering the whole history of the glider pilot regiment. Uh, there is a nice booklet um, by Tim Jenkins on, on the Airborne Forces Experimental Establishment. If you want to know more about Operation Freshman, Richard Wigan wrote an interesting book. Then my um, uh, mate and friend on, on, on uh, the book on Arnhem, Glider Pilots at Arnhem, Mike Peters wrote a fantastic book on glider pilots in Sicily. And another one you should have on your shelf is the one Night at, in June by Kevin Shannon and Stephen Wright, also a superb book. Um, I'm going to put the, the uh, video in as well, and I hope this will work. Uh, one moment. Yes, there we are. And I think... Yes. Do we have a video? Yeah, you're in, uh, Luke. <laughs> very good, very good. <laughs> I think, uh, uh, yeah, some questions, uh, Luke, I think. Yes, right. Um, can you uh, tell me uh, the questions? Yeah, yeah, I'm going to tell uh, um, a lot of compliments on Facebook, so that's great. Uh, it was a fantastic like, uh, Hello, Joel. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Oh, okay. It was a fantastic presentation. No, Luke. no. So, uh, hopefully, yeah, no yeah, questions. yeah. A lot of questions, hopefully. Uh, but no questions coming Joel? in from... Uh, no questions coming in from uh, uh, Facebook, I see. No questions, uh, I see. No. Luke, are you still in or uh, do you have some technical problems? I think uh, Luke has some technical problems with, uh, um, but that's not a problem. When you have questions, um, yeah, spare them for next week because the second part of the presentation about glider pilots will be the next week, next Tuesday at eight o'clock. So, uh, Hopefully you will be there to hear all about the glider pilots at Arnhem, also a little part of the Battle of Arnhem. If you want to know more about glider pilots and you already, already want to read something, then uh, this is recommended to read uh, Luc Buist uh, and Mike Peters about glider pilots at Arnhem. So uh, that's something to, to read. Um, so i see you next week on Tuesday for the second part of glider pilots at Arnhem. And after uh, next week, We'll be organizing uh, a yeah. meeting with Joris and, uh, and David O'Keefe. Um, oh, I have one question coming in for you, Luke, and it's do yes. we know how many glider pilots, regiments, veterans are still alive? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, uh, not exactly, but um, the, the ones that I know, um, we're, there are uh, about, I think it's about 10 that are still um, surviving members of the regiment. Um, uh, one of the legends uh, being uh, Jim Hooper, um, uh, great character, um, uh, also Ron Johnson, uh, um, the last surviving officer of the regiment is still about. Um, uh, so yes, there are a, a number of uh, glider pilots still about, uh, but the, well, they, they, they're getting less and less, uh, uh, but well, if you're in your 19, 90 plus, uh, then, then uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, and a lot of, of, of veterans have passed away. I get a lot of messages because of COVID-19. I yes. have a, a question here. Was there any evidence that any of the gliders were fitted with protection or armor to protect either the crew or pilots? It's from Jason Nee. No, um, not that I know of. Uh, the, the, there was no special protection uh, for, for either uh, crew or uh, pilots. There is a story about a glider, and I think it is in uh, in one of the films, uh, I think even uh, Saving Private Ryan, that a glider was fitted with a special um, 
floor the, to protect uh, the crew. But um, that that's that. I don't know whether that story is true. And I have a question: uh, why where, um, why are they going to load uh, the gliders from the side and not from behind? Uh, well, if you would um, load the gliders through the tail, then you had to connect the um, the, the the cables again, uh, and and if you take the tail off, you have to cut the, cut the cables as well. Um, you can't, uh, and those are the cables that are um, operating the uh, aerolons, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, uh, cutting the tail off is is rather drama uh, drastic, and that's why they they used to load and unload through the side door. And I have a question here from Philip McCarthy: um, Were the survivors of the freshman attack? Um, from the freshman attack, the only survivors were one of the bomber crews that made it back to uh, to the airfield. But um, if you look uh, into the the gliders that that crash landed. And the, the bomber that crash landed, no survivors. Uh, okay. Uh, how many glider pilots uh, were trained in total in World War II? Uh, it's a question from Joop de Lange. Uh, very good question, Joop. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we sometimes did the math on, on, on the number of glider pilots that were used to, uh, to fly to Arnhem. And um, uh, uh, at some stage, it was quite difficult to, to get the exact numbers. But... Um, I would say um, at least um, um, uh, three, four thousand uh, men were trained to to become glider pilots, um, and, and and some of them did just one operation. Um, they were so short of glider pilots after the Arnhem operation that um, the, the 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 Royal Air Force um, supplied pilots to join uh, the glider pilot regiment to be attached to the glider pilot regiment and to fly, to help fly the gliders. Um, so, uh, and, and just a few glider pilots did all the four major operations, which is uh, Sicily, Normandy, Arnhem and Rhine crossing. Okay. I have no more questions coming in. A lot of compliments about your fantastic presentation. Um, I'm looking forward to the next one next week on Tuesday, eight o'clock. Uh, be there for the next uh, great presentation of Luke. And after that, we have a presentation from Joris Nieuwind about Black Friday, also, also interesting when we make a Facebook event. And after that is David O'Keefe telling us all about uh, the JEP rate. So uh, really interesting presentations to come. Have a nice evening. Stay